Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We are just going to give it another uh, minute to let uh, more folks join in, but uh, just stay tuned for another moment. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll get started. So again, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for today's session. My name is Kimberly Brunel and I am the Ontario Regional Support Liaison. I'm so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Cyrus Shah and he's a an hematologist at London Health Sciences Centre. Uh, and he's gonna be talking to us today about how to best interpret our blood work results. I know this is often a hot topic uh, in many of our meetings and you have a lot of questions. So I think this will be a really great topic. If you have any questions at all throughout the presentation, uh, you should see a little chat box. It should be on your bottom right. Uh, feel free to type any questions that you have throughout the presentation uh, and we will cover those uh, at the end. So just type away throughout and we'll cover those at the end. Um, don't worry about trying to write down everything you see we are going to be recording today's presentation and it will be made available on our website uh, probably next week um, so without further ado dr shah i'll pass it to you hi thank you Kim, and uh, thank you uh, to the organization aamac for inviting me so as uh, kim mentioned i'm a hematologist in london ontario uh, i see a variety of different um, patient populations with blood and blood disorders. I'm also privileged to be the program director of the hematology training program here at Western University. And uh, one of the things I really enjoy is teaching and um, sharing some of our knowledge and our questions and our curiosity about uh, blood and the study of blood disorders. So for today, um, I like to if we were doing this in person, welcome you to London, Ontario. Um, there's a couple pictures here that you can see of London during some better weather. If you can see uh, my cursor here, uh, this is um, the Thames River. Uh, it's the smaller Thames compared to the London across the pond there. Uh, and this is the forks at the Thames. And here's a nice city view of London in the fall and then I always ask people that there's also a third picture on here that's hard to see which is the white background here that's London Ontario in the winter. The objectives for today um, that I'm hoping we can cover is um, to talk about parts of your blood test called the complete blood count or the CBC. Um, unfortunately there are many many different blood tests and uh, I don't think we can cover them all in an hour discussion. Each one of them can take many hours, um, but uh, we're gonna try and cover at least parts of the CBC that uh, you may be very well familiar with or have seen in the past. But because I don't know everyone's background, uh, my hope is that uh, we'll start from some basics and um, uh, start to build on that foundation. We're going to talk a little bit about MDS, uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, and um, I was asked by uh, Kim uh, to maybe talk about COVID-19 in the setting of MDS. Uh, and as a disclaimer, I'm not a expert in infectious diseases or COVID-19, but there are some common questions people probably have on that that uh, maybe we can try and cover uh, 
and hopefully if I don't uh, talk for too long, uh, we'll have some time for questions um, and answers at the end, okay? So, uh, oh, and, and I should also say, um, or reiterate that uh, Kim mentioned, if you do have questions along the way, uh, please type them in, in the chat box, and we'll try and cover each of those questions either along the way or at the end. So uh, we'll start with some basics first, and uh, I think this is very exciting, especially when uh, we talk to our medical students for the first time about what blood cells are and where they come from. And we're going to show you some pictures along the way here. So what are blood cells and where do they come from? Well, the easiest way to collect blood, as you know, is taking a blood sample. And often, for those familiar uh, on the line, uh, blood samples are collected by laboratory technologists. Sometimes we refer to them as a phlebotomist who draws a sample of blood and it's collected in a, a tube. Um, and there's different vials or tubes that are used to collect samples depending on what tests we want. And we're going to talk about um, the tube uh, that we collect blood in uh, that tests for something called the complete blood count or the CBC. Um, and we can do a number of different things when we have a sample uh, of blood. We can actually prepare the sample um, and do various tests on it. And we can even look at the cells underneath the microscope here. And we can see what those cells look like. So what is blood made up of, really? So this is a cartoon figure of a blood vessel and the contents spilt out. So the yellow substance is the plasma fluid, that is uh, what allows the blood cells to flow in it. Within blood, it's composed of three main constituents. One is the red blood cells. The other are different types of white blood cells and three platelets. And here's a cartoon figure of each of these uh, different uh, ones floating through a blood vessel. So again, your red blood cells, your platelets, which are the smallest cells in the peripheral blood, and your white blood cells, okay? Now, what, what do you see on your blood form or blood test results when you get it back? Maybe something similar to this, okay? So this is what we have as a printout or as a snapshot of a patient who had blood work done at the London Health Sciences Centre. On the left here, this column, you will see the name of those specific um, tests on each of the elements of a complete blood cell and white cell differential. And we'll talk about what those are. And you will have your personal result. And beside the personal result, you'll see this reference range. Okay, which tells you if your personal result is within the reference range or if it's lower or higher than that reference range. Now, just to be clear, the complete blood count, we usually refer to it as the top part of this collection of blood cell counts. And the white blood cell differential or the diff contains the cells that make up the white blood cells. Okay, so there's two parts to it. If you just ask for the CBC, you'll get this top part, but if you ask for a CBC and a white cell differential or CBC and diff, you'll get both the top and the bottom parts of this set of blood work. So one, one thing that uh, people always struggle with is that why do we call it a complete blood count when it's really not complete? In other words, you might notice on here that where is my iron level? or where is my kidney function um, test, which is the creatinine, for example. What about my liver function? Does this tell me anything about my liver? Does it tell me anything about my thyroid or sugar levels, or cholesterol or calcium or electrolytes and so forth? The answer is no. The complete blood count tells us everything about the constituents of the blood itself, those white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, and descriptions about those cells, okay? Whereas those other tests, if you're interested in learning about iron 
about your kidney function, about your liver function, and so forth, they require other tests, potentially in other test tubes. And that, unfortunately, um, we don't have time for today, but that would require um, another lecture, perhaps. And they are studied by uh, various physicians. It could be your family physician ordering it. It could be other specialists ordering those tests. So even though we call this a complete blood count, it doesn't describe other um, functions of the body. So in order to understand your blood counts, you also need to understand what this reference range is and how do we come up with this reference range. And to give you an example of this, let's talk about height or weight. Okay, so this is a diagram, a histogram of height uh, of women and in blue here, height in men. Okay, and on the bottom here on the x-axis is uh, height in inches and on the y-axis is the number of individuals with that particular height. So if you take a population of women and you plot out how many people have a certain height, for example, 65 inches, then you'll find that 55 of them in that population have that particular height and so forth. And if you plot it out, you get this bell curve or this normal curve. And you can see that curve is very different than the curve for men, perhaps because uh, in that population, men are taller than women. And so at some point, you would like to know perhaps if the average, if the average height for a man and if the individual in front of you fits within that average range somehow. So you have to cut off um, the range somewhere. And how you decide to cut it off depends on what your curve looks like. But I can also tell you that no matter where you put your reference range, wherever you put, let's say for men, I'm going to say the average range is somewhere between 65 inches and maybe 75 inches. I'm sure you can find individuals uh, who are a little bit taller than that, and you're going to find individuals who are a little bit shorter than that. So the reference range is a guide, but it doesn't mean that if your level falls slightly below it or slightly above it, that you have necessarily a disease associated with it. Perhaps it's just a normal variant for you. Okay. So keep that in mind when you're looking at your blood counts as well, is that it may fall slightly below or fall slightly above it, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have a disease that is causing it. It may just be that it is within your normal, that your height or your weight or your thermostat or your temperature is set slightly lower for that value. So the reference range is very important though because um, it tells us, it guides us to look for abnormal values as long as you understand that sometimes those abnormal values can still be within your normal. Now the other thing is that the reference range is, is not a universal, def, uh, universally defined reference range, meaning that if you go from one lab to another, you might find that the reference range is slightly different. So we'll look at the first one, this LKC or leukocyte count. The reference range at London Health Sciences Center is 4.0 to 10.0, but you may have a lab test from a different lab test center uh, or a different hospital, and the range might be slightly different. Okay, And that's because it depends on that lab's techniques, their reagents, their machines, and what their normal, quote unquote, patient population controls were to define that range. Okay, so you always have to look at your number in the context of the reference range for that lab test center that you got your blood work done at. So very important to look at the reference range. So let's talk about each of these constituents of blood. So we'll start with the white blood cells. What are white blood cells? Again, um, in medicine, we always say that, um, you know, we have different names for the same thing, just probably to confuse everybody. So white blood cells are also known as leukocytes or LKC in this um, short form. 
uh, if you look at your own blood test requisition or your blood test results, some labs might call it WBC for white blood cells or another short form. So I, I wouldn't be too caught up or hung up by the fact that the acronym or the letters are slightly different. Okay. White blood cells in general are there in our bodies to help to fight off infections. And there are different types of white blood cells. And here, this uh, on top here, you can see a nice cartoon uh, rendition of the different types of white blood cells that we have. So there are the neutrophils, and they're the most numerous white blood cells in our peripheral blood usually, followed by lymphocytes, then monocytes here, eosinophils, and basophils. What they look like on a peripheral blood film when we look under the microscope might be a little bit different. This neutrophil here, you can see how the nucleus has different lobes. It almost looks like a face, followed by these lymphocytes here, followed by this monocyte, and here's an eosinophil and a basophil. And this is a uh, band neutrophil, which is a little bit younger than this um, mature neutrophil here. Okay. Each of these white blood cells have very important functions. One of the questions I always get asked about um, these white blood cells when we look under the microscope uh, is why are they not white? Well, it turns out that um, these under the microscope, we've stained them so that we can tell the different characteristics of the nucleus. But when there's so many of them in real life, in an inflammatory response that you might see, like in pus, it looks white. And that's where it got its name, white blood cells. So here's a couple more um, renditions of uh, what these white blood cells do. And again, they're primarily there in our bodies to help fight off infections, and they have a role to play in inflammation. So this is a cartoon figure, three-dimensional, of a, a, a bacterium or some sort of um, uh, organism that's invading the body. And our white blood cells are defense mechanisms to, uh, to fight that off. Here's another one, a, a small bacteria in here that um, this neutrophil uh, is gobbling it up, ingests it, and digests that bacteria. So how do you know how your white blood cells are doing? Well, again, the LKC or the leukocyte count tells you what your white blood cell numbers are like compared to the reference range. So this individual, their white blood cell count is low at 0 0.9 compared to the normal 4.0 to 10.0. But it's also important to know that the white blood cells are made up of these different white blood cells, including these neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. And we can actually test each of those and figure out which ones are low. But in order to find those numbers out, your physician would ask for not only a CBC, but a CBC with a white blood cell differential, or CBC and diff. And that's how you will know for example, this person's neutrophils are very low at 0 0.3 compared to the normal reference range in that lab being 2.0 to 7.5. So you might say, well, which white blood cells are important? Well, they all are important, but which ones are necessary for fighting off which types of infections? They all do, uh, they all have a different function. So if they are low, then you are at high risk of certain types of problems or infections. So neutrophils, by and large, are the ones that you should probably know, particularly in patients with MDS, is because they are very, very important for fighting off bacteria and fungi. Lymphocytes are very important as well. They help to fight off viruses. Monocytes help fight infections as well in collaboration with neutrophils and these other white blood cells. Uh, and they help to engulf um, infections and debris. Eosinophils are important for fighting off larger parasites and or uh, help to mount an allergic response. Um, basophils are important for releasing histamine and are part of our inflammatory response. Neutrophils, again, I'll spend 
a uh, little bit of time just mentioning that uh, when it's low, you might have heard the term neutropenia. That means low neutrophil counts. And when you have neutropenia, you are at high risk of getting bacterial infections. One of the things that your physicians, your nurses, or others may have told you is that if you do have neutropenia, to watch out for fevers. And if a patient has a fever and neutropenia, you might have heard the term febrile neutropenia, and that is important uh, to seek medical attention because patients with febrile neutropenia are at very high risk of having major infections. Um, if you have any questions about the white blood cells, uh, you can go ahead and type it in the chat box, uh, but I'll move on to the red blood cells. Okay. So red blood cells too are very, very important. They too have other names. We also call red blood cells erythrocytes, and uh, we might use the term ERC uh, as a short uh, form of erythrocytes. Uh, and you can see here the erythrocyte number in this patient, for example, is a little below 2.87, uh, where the normal reference range is 4.5 to 6.5. Uh, one thing I didn't comment on is uh, the units here. So you also see in your lab requisition form, it might include the units. So for white blood cells, it's not really four white cells to 10 white cells. It's actually four to 10, and it should have times 10 to the ninth power per liter. That means there is 9 billion cells per liter or 4 to 10 billion white blood cells per liter of blood. Red blood cells are even more than that. This unit here is actually 4.5 to 6.5 times 10 to the 12th power per liter. That means that there's actually 4.5 to 6.5 trillion red blood cells per liter of blood. These are by far the most numerous cells in our body. Okay. So um, you also have to have a look at the units, which were not included in this reference range, um, but that is also important to know as well. So it's not that you have 2.87 red blood cells. This is actually 2.87 trillion red blood cells per liter of blood. And typically our bodies have about five liters of blood on average. Red blood cells, again, are so important because they carry oxygen to our tissues and understanding their shape, their size, what they contain, and different parameters of the red blood cell helps us understand um, that ability to deliver oxygen, but also what problems there might be. So uh, the indices or the parameters that we can measure on red blood cells include things like hemoglobin that you might be very familiar with, the hematocrit, the MCV or the mean corpuscular volume or the mean cell volume, the RDW, the red cell distribution width. Okay, so we'll try and cover those a little quickly in case you do have questions about them. Um, but all of these parameters, hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCV, RDW, really are descriptions of parts of the red blood cell. Right. So hemoglobin is so important because they are the primary uh, oxygen carrying ability of blood. Um, we can't carry oxygen uh, in uh, any uh, other good way in the body. So oxygen, um, each oxygen is bound to uh, hemoglobin in our red blood cells, and hemoglobin are the main protein constituents of our red blood cells. There are hundreds of thousands of hemoglobin molecules in a red blood cell. So this red blood cell, as you can see how it kind of looks like a, a bit of a donut shape, um, but there's no hole in it. It's more like a Boston cream donut, and you squeeze the middle a bit. Um, and within this really sack, of fluid is hemoglobin. And again, uh, hemoglobin looks like you can see it's made up of four components. These are called globin chains. It's usually two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains. Each globin has a heme ring, which has an iron atom, which the oxygen uh, molecule then binds to. 
So here's another rendition of hemoglobin in red blood cells. And again, there's trillions of red cells in our blood vessels at any given time. And hemoglobin molecules, there's hundreds of thousands in each red blood cell. And each hemoglobin molecule, again, has this heme ring, which has iron in it, one iron atom in each heme ring, and oxygen then binds uh, to that and gets uh, carried from the lungs uh, via the blood to our tissues, and that oxygen gets offloaded. So hemoglobin, if anything, we don't necessarily look at the number of red blood cells. We're more important at looking at the hemoglobin number itself. Uh, so hemoglobin in this patient you can see is 83, and the normal reference range for men is 135 to 170. For women, that range is often different. So for women, it is 115 to 160 at the LHSC or London Health Sciences Center. But again, if you look at your own lab requisition form, you might see a different reference range. Why is hemoglobin so important? If you're not delivering oxygen to your tissues, what can happen to you? Well, if you start from head to toe, um, you can see a number of different symptoms. So if you're not delivering oxygen to your brain, then you can often feel very tired. You can feel dizzy or faint. Uh, the eyes, some people might notice some yellowing of the eyes or the conjunctiva might be pale. The skin might be pale. You might feel cold. There might be some yellowing of the skin as well. Uh, the muscles, whether it's the respiratory muscles um, or the uh, skeletal muscles, you might feel weaker. If you're not delivering oxygen, um, then the heart and lungs work harder. So the, the lungs are working harder, you feel more short of breath. If you're not delivering oxygen into your intestinal uh, cells, then um, uh, you might have abdominal uh, symptoms. But uh, if a cause of uh, your red blood cells is the red cells are breaking apart, it might uh, cause yellowing of your skin and eyes and also changes of colors of your stool. You might be more pale. Uh, blood vessels, you might have lower blood pressure. Uh, heart, you might uh, have a faster heart rate because again, your heart is pounding uh, faster. So you might have palpitations or the sensation of your heart racing or skipping a beat. People might even have outright chest pain, angina and heart attacks because it's not getting enough oxygen to the muscles of the heart. And then uh, so in some patients, the spleen might get enlarged for different causes. So that's why hemoglobin is very important. These other indices also help us give us an idea of what that red blood cell component is like. Something called the hematocrit you might hear about. We don't necessarily talk about hematocrit uh, so much in MDS, but we talk about it in some other conditions. The hematocrit is if we take a vial of your blood uh, here, for example, and uh, you can see uh, if you spin it down on a centrifuge, the larger cells like the red blood cells go to the bottom and then there's a layer, uh, buffy coat layer that is uh, white blood cells and platelets and the remainder is this plasma, so just this liquid. Okay, But the red blood cells um, should be in a certain range. If, it, if we were all red blood cells in our blood, well, then it can't move. It would be sludging along because you need that liquid in order to help it move or flow along. Uh, but if you have very low red blood cells, then you can imagine you're very dilute. Okay. And so there's a range for your hematocrit. So the hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells that make up the volume of your whole uh, blood volume. And so the usual range is 40% or 0 0.40 to 51% or 0.51. And this individual has less red blood cells in total, so they have 0.25 as an example here. So other indices, again, uh, include the MCV, this is the mean cell volume or mean corpuscular volume. This is the average size of your red blood cells. 
And again, if you plot all of these red cell sizes on a histogram, so let's say these are the sizes and they're extremely small. We didn't give you the units here, but they're in femtoliters, extremely small. Uh, we can't see this with the naked eye. And if you plot all the size of the red cells, the average size of the red cell will be somewhere in the middle. And again, they'll be in a particular range here. Um, but patients who say have iron deficiency, they can't make red blood cells in a normal size, they make smaller red blood cells. So their mean cell volume will be smaller. In patients with MDS, if the red blood cells are made abnormally and they're a little bit larger, then we will see that this curve is shifted over and they have a larger average white, uh, red blood cell. So their MCV will maybe be larger. The RDW also give us clues as well. It tells us how variable the sizes of these red cells are. In this picture here, you can see that the size of these red blood cells, they seem to be very, very uniform looking. They kind of look the same. But if you have red cells that are small on the one hand and red cells that are large, then if you plot it out, there might be two different peaks for the sizes of your red blood cells. And the distribution, that means the variability of that red blood cell might be wider. There are cells that are much smaller here and there's cells that are much wider or larger here. So the, the distribution is wider. In this patient with MDS, their MCV, their size of their red blood cells are normal and their red cell distribution with the variability is normal. So typically we don't look at these indices unless patients have anemia and they tell your physicians and tell us that, you know, could there be an underlying reason that might fit that picture? Uh, again, if you have any questions about red blood cells, uh, please type it in the chat box and then we'll try and cover it at, uh, at the end. Or if you have questions now, we can cover it. Um, for platelets, so again, the main constituents of blood, again, are white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And platelets, again, uh, have a different name. So one different name that it is given is called thrombocytes. Okay. Um, so either platelets, sometimes we write platelets as PLT here. There's no short form that they put in here, but uh, thrombocytes, another way of saying platelets. Um, the normal range for platelets are 150 to 400. And again, uh, the units here would be times 10 to the ninth power per liter. So there's actually 150 billion to 400 billion uh, platelets per liter of blood. And this patient has less than 10 here. Okay. So platelets, what are they important for? Platelets help to form that clot. Um, so if you, this is a blood vessel. If you get a cut and you cut a blood vessel, uh, as you know, you'll bleed. But what stops that bleed or forms that platelet plug or clot are these platelets. Platelets don't work alone though. They work in conjunction with clotting factors that help to form this mesh or net of network. And then red blood cells also get clogged in there and white cells get clogged in there. But uh, platelets are essential for helping to form that platelet plug. And even though they're small, they're very, very important in that process. Okay. If you have too little platelets, then you're a higher risk of easy bleeding and bruising. This is just a picture taken from a patient uh, with uh, low platelets from a different reason than MDS, but you can also see in here, you can get easy uh, bruises within mucosal membranes. Uh, and on the skin, you can see here that there are larger bruises. Sometimes we call it purpura or ecchymosis. Uh, and pinpoint spots, sometimes we call that petechia. So you can get different sizes of bruises, but definitely bleeding is important. And bleeding can be both uh, bleeding that you can see, like nosebleeds, but bleeding um, can also um, be internal bleeding, which is very important. So internal bleeding, um, uh, you might not be able to see if it's within the gut, 
maybe sometimes you see blood in the stool um, or dark, dark black tarry stool. Uh, so one, one uh, question that you um, might see on, or sorry, one, uh, one question uh, here, I think on the chat box is, uh, what about platelet clumping? Um, so that is an artifact. Uh, so in platelets, sometimes in the test tube for some individuals, um, because of certain antibodies, the way it interacts with that sample in the test tube is the platelets seem to clump up in the test tube itself and the machine cannot read the uh, number of platelets accurately. Uh, in certain labs, what that might require is to do the blood test in a different test tube that doesn't cause the platelet clumping to occur, or at the London Health Sciences Center, depending on the, uh, the counter that we use, uh, we may be able to get an accurate platelet count with a different, um, different set of tools, we'll call it. Okay, so if you do see platelet clumping here, it doesn't mean that you have a disease, it just means that there was a technical issue with the lab and you'll have to talk to your physician to have your blood work repeated to get in a more accurate count, if that answers uh, the question. Okay, so um, any questions about those before we move on to the next section, which is, you might ask yourself, where do all these blood cells come from? because if we understand where it comes from, we can understand what can cause disease, but maybe even make it better by replacing uh, the cells that are not there. And you might have heard of a bone marrow uh, and a bone marrow test and a bone marrow biopsy. So the bone marrow, uh, as you can see here, a rendition of uh, the femur or the thigh bone in here uh, is uh, in adults as uh, we grow, the, uh, the middle parts of the long bone seem to dry up. Um, you have more of a yellowish marrow. And at the ends of the uh, bones here, you can see there's red in here, and uh, that's the factory where our blood is being made. Um, and in here, in that spongy part, in that red marrow, is where the factory is making all of our white blood cells and uh, red blood cells and platelets. Okay. So this factory um, is not the type of factory you think about where it's, uh, you know, you take uh, like a car assembly and you put the different parts together and it forms a, a car. How we get these blood cells that you're familiar with now, white cells, red cells and platelets, is that they actually start from a stem cell, a bone marrow or blood stem cell in the bone marrow. And how these stem cells eventually become one of these cells is that they divide, they keep dividing. So as they divide, some of those cells will still stay as stem cells to continue uh, to provide more cells in the future. But some of those stem cells eventually become more differentiated, we say a term that describes that it has more characteristics of something else. So a myeloid stem cell and a lymphoid stem cell. A lymphoid stem cell, as it continues to divide, eventually it becomes more characteristic of a, a lymphoid early cell called a lymphoblast. And eventually, as it keeps dividing, it becomes a mature lymphocyte. Okay, so that's how we get our lymphocytes. Eventually, um, through many cell divisions from early stem cell. And the myeloid stem cells, they keep dividing. Eventually, some of them become these white blood cells called uh, neutrophils. Some of them become uh, platelets, and some of them become red blood cells um, as the easiest description of how these cells are made. So really, if we have good blood stem cells, then we can eventually get good uh, mature white blood cells, red cells, and platelets. However, if we have abnormal blood stem cells, then whatever they make may be abnormal that are produced. If you want to know how your bone marrow is doing, we have to do a bone marrow biopsy. That's taking a sample from somewhere in that red 
marrow or that spongy bone marrow somehow. And how we do it is usually in the pelvic bone. This is probably the safest area that we can get a bone marrow sample. So you may have a person where you've experienced laying on your side or on your front, on your abdomen, and uh, the uh, hematologist or your physician uh, usually uh, has uh, you draped um, and cleans the area in that back usually freezes and takes a couple of samples uh, with various tubes. And what you're doing is you're putting that needle in. You're not taking a bone sample. We're not looking at the cortical bone or the hard part of the bone. We're trying to take a sample of the soft, spongy stuff where those blood stem cells are being made and looking at how those cells look under a microscope and do various tests on it. So this is another uh, example of rendition of somebody having a bone marrow done, but they're laying on their front and the area in the back is draped, cleaned. Um, you have uh, freezing locally and then uh, this Jamshidi biopsy needle is inserted and samples are taken out. Okay. And again, the samples were taken out is to try and figure out where these cells are coming from and are there any abnormalities that's contributing to it. So we're going to move on to the next section, unless people have questions about uh, how to interpret the CBC, the complete blood count, those white cells, red cells, and platelets. So MDS is myelodysplastic syndromes, it's plural. And this is the uh, technical definition. So don't get too hung up about this. I'll try and explain it. Myelodysplastic syndromes form a group of clonal hematopoietic stem cell malignancies characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis in one or more cell lineages, associated peripheral cytopenias, and risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. You might be scratching your heads, as um, all of our students would be scratching their heads as well. But not to worry. When I studied and trained as a, um, a student, under the, my predecessor, Dr. Robert Barr, um, and, and uh, um, uh, by all means, I, I have nothing against Ford or the Ford Pinto, but Dr. Robert Barr, um, his example of this was that um, having a bone marrow like MDS is kind of like having the Ford factory produce these Ford Pintos. Apparently, I've never owned a Ford Pinto, but uh, I don't know if this is Dr. Robert Barr's car or not, uh, this is just a representation, but um, uh, apparently uh, the slightest bump um, in in the car and it could self-combust. And so what the MDS bone marrow is like compared to the M, um, compared to Ford factory producing this Ford Pinto is that um, the cells, if they're made with defects, then they don't survive as long as they should on the highways, which is on the in the circulation of your blood. So if your red blood cells have these defects and they're breaking down sooner, then you have fewer red blood cells or fewer hemoglobin, so you become anemic. Uh, if you have platelets that are made with these defects, then they break down sooner and you have low platelets or thrombocytopenia. If you have white blood cells like this that break down sooner and you have low white blood cells. And again, that term, if your neutrophils are low, we call it neutropenia. Okay. So um, MDS, myelodysplastic syndromes, then in uh, perhaps other words than those technical words is really a, not one disease, but is a group of blood and bone marrow disorders that if you call it a malignancy, we should really call it a cancer, where the blood cells are made with these defects and they don't survive as long as they should. What this leads to then is that you have low blood counts in one or more of your blood cells. So it might not just be your white blood cells that are low. It may not just be that your red cells are low. You could have maybe white cells and red cells that are low. You might have platelets and white cells that are low. You can have any combination. You can have all three of those being low. This is not 
to be technically uh, correct, this is not leukemia, but we often consider it a pre-leukemic state, meaning that patients with MDS can transform into a type of leukemia, an acute leukemia. Again, this is not one disease, it's perhaps many different types of diseases, and really every person's MDS is slightly different. Um, they behave very differently. So one person experience with MDS may be very different than another person's experience with MDS. So um, how, off, how common is this condition? The actual incidence of MDS, how common people develop it in the general population, is really difficult to determine. It's unknown, really. These are just estimates. So the World Health Organization, WHO, has estimated approximately three to four individuals per 100,000 per year develop MDS. But the more, this is a disease we say of the elderly because individuals over the age of 65, 70, over the age of 75, have a higher risk of developing MDS. It's much more common in the elderly population. And why is that? Well, it's we don't know what causes MDS. Uh, so sometimes you might hear the term, it's idiopathic, meaning we don't know, or your doctors are idiots. But in either case, it can be secondary to toxic exposures, such as chemotherapy, radiation, or environmental toxins that cause it. In some cases, there are some hereditary disorders that increase the risk of those individuals developing MDS. But by and large, MDS is not hereditary, meaning that you don't directly transmit or trans, um, uh, pass on a gene that uh, automatically induces MDS in uh, the next generation but there are some genetics that predispose those individuals to conditions like MDS. So why, why is it that MDS develop in older individuals is because of that idea that these cells start from a blood stem cell. And as those stem cells divide and grow, they have to copy their DNA identically. And if mistakes happen, the body have ways of clearing or destroying those um, abnormal cells. But once in a while, that cell with the mistake might get away. And if that cell gets away and continues to grow and go out of control, all of its cells that are made from that abnormal stem cell could be abnormal. And again, if that abnormal stem cell makes these abnormal red blood cells to die off sooner, then you have this MDS type of condition. So with age, unfortunately, the probability is that we have many more cells dividing. We have many more chances of uh, developing a mutation in a stem cell that lives on and causes these abnormal cells to persist. What's the impact of MDS on the patient and on society? Well, for the patient with MDS, they're gonna have potentially poor quality of life because they may need transfusions. So again, coming back to the analogy of the Ford factory, for example, if your um, factory is making these cars with abnormalities in them, and you want cars in the highways, to deliver oxygen or deliver um, cargo, then perhaps you can import other cars, and that is a blood transfusion. Okay, so you're getting um, blood from someone else's body, and those cells hopefully are normal and able to carry oxygen. Those red cells are able to carry oxygen to the rest of your tissue. So. It requires a transfusion, though, requires time and commitment. It's not as simple as an instantaneous transaction. This requires, for those of you who've had a transfusion, 
time sitting in a IV therapy clinic, a chemotherapy suite, in a hospital bed setting where you're having this infused in, for most units of red blood cells, it often takes an individual an hour to two hours for it to infuse in, sometimes even longer. With too many transfusions, people can get complications of iron overload. Remember, each hemoglobin has four iron atoms in there. And so every time you're getting red cells, you're getting iron, and that iron can accumulate over time. One can have cardiorespiratory symptoms, again, like we said, for anemia, um, that's extra work on the heart and the lungs. And so they can have, again, those chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, and even outright heart attacks. It may require hospitalization for these cardiac complications if it's a heart attack, for example. Infections, because if their white cells are low, then they're having more infections. If their platelets are low, they have high risk of bleeding. And they have an increased risk, like we said, to acute leukemia. So they could transform into leukemia down the road, more so than the average individual or the average person in the population. And they have a higher risk of dying from this. So there's an increased risk of shorter survival. The impact on society is that transfusion is not a, uh, uh, not a magical resource that we have to, um, that's unlimited. Transfusions are a limited and very precious resource that are provided uh, by volunteer donors in Canada. They're tested, there's a whole process, and they're expensive, okay? And they're not without risk either. Uh, hospitalization for patients who have cardiac complications, infections, complications of their iron overload, the bleeding, and when or if they transform into uh, leukemia. The mainstay of management for these patients with MDS is supportive. So again, if their body is not making these cells quite right, uh, for example, if their red cells are not made quite right and their cells are dying off sooner, they need more red blood cells, then they may need a red blood cell transfusion. This is uh, an example of a, um, a unit of red blood cells or a pint of red blood cells. And uh, some people, if their platelets are low, they may need a platelet transfusion, which looks a little bit different. It's a more of a yellowish liquid. Um, so for patients, though, you might say, you know, what level do I need to be transfused at? There is no one universal level of hemoglobin that fits everybody. So this is the transfusion threshold. For some patients, where their hemoglobin is below 70, they're not functioning well. They may be very short of breath, having chest pain, not being able to function. Um, and so they will need a transfusion at that level. Whereas somebody else might need a transfusion at a hemoglobin of 80. Okay, so everyone's level is a little bit different. So this is dependent on the level of hemoglobin, but also what their symptoms are with their hemoglobin being low or anemia. Treatments for MDS then. So one question is, if your bone marrow factory has these abnormal cells that are being produced from these abnormal blood stem cells, what can you do about it? What can you do with this patient with MDS? How can you make your bone marrow perhaps produce more red blood cells? Or how can you have your body make normal cells? Well, it depends again on the type of MDS because MDS is not one disease. If you are classified as having a lower risk MDS and there are these scoring systems that your physicians might use with you, is that you can have transfusions and or other supportive care, which includes antibiotics. Um, but you can also give your body or you can take a medication called erythropoietin, or EPO for short. It's a hormone that our kidneys normally make to stimulate the bone marrow factory and making more red blood cells. So if your body is not producing enough, either of the hormone, 
erythropoietin, or the bone marrow you think can still do better if you tell it to make more red blood cells, you can take a medication called erythropoietin. But again, this is not for everybody with MDS. This is only for certain types of MDS where uh, we think they may benefit from it. If you have too much transfusions, uh, too much iron from those transfusions, then you may need to get rid of that iron. And uh, there are iron chelating medications, medications you can that will bind to the excess iron and get rid of it. If you have a special type of MDS where on your chromosomes in the bone marrow show this 5Q deletion, what that is is each of our cells, we didn't uh, have a chance to talk about the cytogenetics or what the genetic makeup is, but we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in those cells, uh, in those stem cells, and if the long arm of the fifth chromosome is deleted, they have a unique type of MDS where they may benefit from a drug medication called lenalidomide or Revlimid is the trade name for it. Okay. However, if you're designated as more of a higher risk MDS, you can still get transfusions and other supportive care like antibiotics if needed. But this time, those individuals with higher risk MDS often have a worse outcome than those with lower risk MDS. And so we are more aggressive in those individuals in trying to change the underlying disease itself. Well, how do you change the underlying disease if your stem cells are abnormal? And maybe another analogy here that people have used is like your garden. So if your garden that you want all these nice flowers to come out, but it has a lot of weeds and these weeds are your stem cells from these abnormal MDS stem cells. You can try and pull them up one at a time, but often that's not possible. And so you look over at your neighbor's garden, which is nice and perfect and neatly kept, and has no weeds on it. So you say, well, okay, maybe one way is just to completely start over. And so a stem cell transplant is that idea, is that you're trying to start over. You're gonna take your garden, your stem, your bone marrow, you're gonna wipe it all out um, and remove everything, the good and the bad cells. Um, so that's with heavy duty chemotherapy. And then you take your neighbor's stem cells or their seeds for those plants and you replant them into your garden and hope that it starts to regrow into normal flowers and that you have a perfectly good garden like your neighbors. Okay, so you're going to get stem cells from a normal donor and they're going to start to repopulate and make normal white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. But the stem cell transplant is not a walk in the park. It's actually reserved for those who are younger and fit enough um, with very severe disease with these higher risk MDS that it would benefit for. So in fact, most patients, as we said, with MDS are diagnosed older in, or later in life, and so would not be a candidate for a stem cell transplant. Depending on the center, that age might be anywhere from 60 to 70 to even 75, okay? But typically, the older one is, um, there is a higher risk of complications with stem cell transplants. So it is reserved for those who are younger and fit. Those who are not a candidate for stem cell transplant, there are medications. One of them is called the DASA or azacitidine. It is used in this, this higher risk MDS to try and reduce um, the complications of the disease to reduce the need for transfusions, to reduce the risk of transforming to acute leukemia. But it too has its side effects and its cost. The cost to the patient is that they have to travel to a cancer center that provides this medication as an injection medication seven days every 28 days. Okay, anybody have any questions about that? Hopefully the future is that maybe we will find 
a way to make your bone marrow, the MDS, uh, a factory that can make cars, make these cells some somewhat uh, better. So next section, we're gonna move on to COVID-19. Let me know how I'm doing for time, um, if everyone's okay. Um, so COVID-19 is an important topic. Uh, recently, people have lots of questions about. We're going to try and talk about it in the context of MDS. What does it mean in patients with MDS? But just quickly, uh, COVID-19, as you all know, is a coronavirus. It's a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses are actually a large family of different viruses. There are so many viruses out there that causes illness and issues both in people and in animals. And these human coronaviruses um, are common and are typically associated with mild illnesses similar to the common cold. Okay, so we've, we've actually experienced coronaviruses in the past. COVID-19 is a new disease that has not been previously identified in humans. And, and that's what makes it challenging is that because humans haven't been exposed to this before, we don't have any natural immunity to it. Uh, rarely, animal coronaviruses can infect people, and more rarely, these can spread from person-to-person -person contact. And, and these human coronaviruses, a lot of them could have come from um, other reservoirs, meaning other animals that were uh, uh, harboring it for a while. Human coronaviruses cause infections mainly of the nose, the throat, and the lungs. And that's why they're commonly spread and infected through these mechanisms. So respiratory droplets generated when you cough or sneeze, uh, close, uh, prolonged personal contact, such as touching or shaking of the hand, so you're transmitting the virus um, that way, touching something with the virus on it, and then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes before washing your hands. So current evidence does suggest that person-to-person um, -person spread is efficient when there is close contact. And uh, this is information from the Government of Canada or Health Canada uh, that you can uh, read up yourself as well. If you have other questions, they have a frequently asked question page for it. How did it all start? As you know, um, there was some form of quote unquote pneumonia of unknown cause initially detected in Wuhan, China. It was first reported on December 31st in 2019 to the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization has been uh, analyzing data. They've been um, providing advice and coordinating with partners and helping countries prepare and increase supplies and manage expert networks. If you would like more information, I would suggest that you look at the WHO uh, website for more information. They also have a list of frequently asked questions. They have a tracking record for the number of cases on a daily basis. It was then declared a public health emergency of international concern in January 30, 2020. Uh, as you know, it does require lots of uh, funding in order to help uh, different um, uh, countries, potentially with weaker health uh, systems. And then finally, the, the name COVID-19 was established in February 11, 2020. Uh, COVID-19, just for nomenclature and understanding the terms here, COVID-19, uh, the disease name comes from coronavirus infectious disease 19. The virus is actually called SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so this is a causative agent of COVID-19, the disease. So the, the virus, when we talk about it, is the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. That's to uh, differentiate it from SARS-CoV, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus one, which was the causative agent of SARS back in the pandemic in 2002, 2003. Okay. Worldwide, uh, I was doing this last minute uh, last night uh, to make sure you have some updated data. This is um, published by the World Health Organization. Again, they updated on a daily basis. And as you know, uh, there's so much in terms of change and understanding COVID-19 that every hour it seems we're getting new information and different information. So this is as of updated as of yesterday, um, uh, April 18, 2020 at 3 a.m. I wasn't up at 3 a.m., but uh, anyways, this, this data seemed to be uh, dated at 3 a.m. 
Um, so I guess they publish it a little bit ahead of time. Anyways, these are the current numbers that you can see. The, the circles are, um, the size of the circles tell us how many uh, are in each circle, number of cases. So uh, the total number of cases worldwide is far greater than um, 2 million currently. The number of new cases in that one given day was 77,000, and the number of deaths have been over 139,000. In Canada, as you know, we're not immune. We also have a number of cases in, in Canada. Uh, in total, as of uh, yesterday, uh, we're up to 28,000 and more. And the uh, number of new cases in one day have been over 1,300, and number of deaths over 1,000. So this is truly a pandemic. Um, and you might have heard of uh, this term, which is trying to flatten the curve. And this is very important because um, as a healthcare system, if uh, patients come in one at a time through the emergency room in a slow, steady pace, uh, the emergency medical system uh, can handle those individuals and treat patients individually. But if everybody comes all at once, then you overwhelm the system and individuals may not get the care that they need and potentially you can have a number of deaths because of it. So this is a graphical representation of what flattening the curve means and what, what it can do to the system. So this is time, and then this is number of cases on the y-axis. So over time, without protective measures, uh, if everybody um, are not using uh, all the social distancing rules and protective measures, then uh, you can have a huge number of cases coming all at once and it overwhelms our healthcare system. But if you use protective measures, hopefully the spread is slowed down and you're flattening this curve out so that patients um, are still coming and people are still getting infected, um, but you're slowing it down so that uh, the number coming to emergency medical services and hospitals is reduced so that we can manage those patients on a steady pace. So how can you flatten the curve, as um, the saying goes, uh, is with a number of um, different uh, strategies. In Canada here, just to show you what our current trajectory is for the number of cases um, over the number of days so far, compared to other countries with different strategies. Uh, you might say, oh, Canada is here. We might be doing better than certain other countries so far. but Remember, this is just a snapshot in time. Uh, we are, uh, the number of cases in Canada, um, there is a time bias, meaning that uh, countries like uh, uh, France, Spain, Italy uh, started ahead of time. So, so you can see that their curves are somewhat flattening out a bit, and hopefully uh, the Canadian curve as well, we're either on a trajectory that's still increasing, or hopefully also flattening out as well with uh, the different measures uh, to prevent spread. And so those preventative measures, if you heard many times from the government of Canada in an effort to prevent the spread of uh, COVID-19 within communities across the country, all Canadians, this doesn't mean just patients with MDS, all Canadians uh, should stay at home unless you have to go to work. Talk to your employer about working at home if at all possible avoid all essential uh, trip, non-essential trips in your community, do not gather in groups, limit contact to people at higher risk, such as older patients and those in poor health. And this would be, this would include individuals with forms of cancer, forms of blood disorders like MDS and those who are on chemotherapy. Uh, you should limit uh, uh, going outside uh, but you can go outside to exercise, but you should stay close to home. If you leave your home, you should always keep a distance of at least two arm lengths. And uh, so you've heard that two meters or six feet apart in household context. People you live with do not need to distance from each other unless they are sick or have traveled in the last 14 days. Um, so you've seen all of these posters and so forth, uh, that two meter or six feet apart. Um, is very important for uh, preventing the spread and some of these sneezing, um, 
and uh, preventing those droplets uh, from getting onto you and then you uh, touching your face. Proper hand hygiene is very important and uh, proper hand hygiene can help reduce the risk of infection or spreading infection to others. So you should wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after using the washroom or when preparing food. Use alcohol-based hand sanitizers if soap and water are not available. When coughing or sneezing, you should cough and sneeze into a tissue or to bend up your elbow, not your hand. Dispose any tissues you have used as soon as possible in a lined waste basket and wash your hands afterwards. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth with unwashed hands. And certainly you've all seen these pictures in the media, uh, perhaps is that um, don't touch your face. So you can do various things like keep a cone over your head and face. Um, of course, uh, um, people have joked that, uh, you know, you should not touch your own face, but maybe you can touch someone else's face. Try not to touch anyone's face. Okay, so um, there is some uh, guidelines or some guidance, I would say, from different societies. Um, I would uh, direct you to the American Society of Hematology, the ASH uh, recommendations. They publish some on various cancers of blood and blood disorders. And I'm going to just read to you some of the things that uh, you might have questions about in COVID-19 and MDS. So here are some commonly asked questions that they have uh, published some of their responses. Now, keep in mind that this is um, uh, from the U.S. perspective, and uh, we'll, we'll go through and see if uh, it is relevant to us in Canada as well. So are patients with MDS or related conditions more likely to contract COVID-19 or to get seriously ill from it? So right now, there is limited data, okay, because it is so new. Um, and things are evolving so quickly, it would only be afterwards that uh, when data is collected that we'll have more information. But so far there are no data yet indicating that patients with MDS related conditions, so those other related bone marrow conditions, are more likely to contract COVID-19 than patients with fully functional bone marrows. The neutrophil, and again those are the white cells that fight bacteria and functional neutrophil defects, that many patients with MDS um, have an increased risk of bacterial and fungal infections that we mentioned before to a greater extent than the risk of viral infections. So again, patients with MDS, we saw that the neutrophil count is low, so we call that neutropenia, where the neutrophils may not work quite as well, they're not as functional. So those individuals are at higher risk of bacterial infections, not necessarily this viral infection with COVID-19. They say, that being said, preliminary studies seem to indicate a high percentage of hospitalized patients have a current or previous cancer diagnosis in patients with MDS who have recently undergone allogeneic stem cell transplant have a markedly increased risk of viral infection, and this risk is likely to extend to coronavirus. So what it's saying there is that for those of you who have gone through an allogeneic stem cell transplant for MDS, you've been put on a number of different medications, you've gone through a number of different things, there may be other conditions like complications like graft versus host disease. And that increases um, one's risk of viral infections because it's not just the neutrophils that might be affected, but the other parts of the immune system that are required to fight off viruses. It is thus reasonable to presume that patients with MDS, particularly those who are more lymphopenic, meaning those lymphocytes, remember we said are the, the white cells that fight viruses, if they're low um, or who have undergone transplant within last year are compromised in their ability to, to contain the virus once infected. So it doesn't increase your risk of getting the infection. You should still practice social distancing, washing your hands and so forth. But once you get it, it's very difficult for those individuals to contain the infection. And so they're higher, they have a higher likelihood of hospitalization and the need for intensive care. Uh, the neutropenia, however, increases their risk of secondary bacterial infection after a viral infection. So patients who have a viral infection, we often see this uh, before this pandemic, even in patients not with uh, bone marrow conditions like MDS, is that when one gets a viral infection, they can have a secondary or superimposed bacterial infection on top of it. 
Okay, so the individuals with MDS don't have an increased risk of getting COVID-19, but when they do, they may have a worse outcome is the bottom line. Should the approach to therapy in patients with MDS and related conditions be altered, meaning starting treatment, choice of treatment, transplant considerations? So there's a lot in here to unpack, but I think it's important if you do have MDS and you're having this discussion with your physician to think about. Okay. So remember we said MDS is not one disease. If you're a patient with higher risk MDS, um, and again, there's different scoring systems to determine if you have higher risk MDS, they should still be started on therapy with these hypomethylating agents. Again, azacitidine or videza, we, we mentioned, is a type of hypomethylating agent without delay and without dose adjustment. Those already on such therapy with adequate tolerance and clinical response should continue given the relapse uh, risk of hypomethylating agents are discontinued. So if you're on treatment, if you're high risk MDS and you're already on treatment, you should continue. It is unclear if hypomethylating agents influence the clinical course of COVID-19 infection. And hypomethylating agents do alter cellular type 1 interferon response, which could hypothetically alter replication of cellular response to viruses, but there's no evidence of clinical significance of this observation. What that is saying is that um, right now, we don't know if those patients on uh, a hypomethylating agent like Videza that they have a worse outcome when they get infected with COVID-19. And there is some uh, basic science data um, that's a little bit controversial there. Okay. But bottom line is that if you are on Videza and you have higher risk of disease and you can continue your treatment uh, and it's safe to do so, you should consider it. All right. But what I'm going to uh, mention here is for those of you who are on Videza and your treatment has been delayed in Canada, it is a balance between um, the need for ongoing treatment and your risk of exposure every time you come to a cancer center. Remember, you have for Videza, you have to come seven times, seven days, every month or every 28 days. So you're increasing your risk every time you're having a uh, visit to the cancer center. So you have to balance that out in, in that context. Okay. For lower risk MDS patients, again, whatever scoring system you use, the goals of therapy um, are to minimize transfusions, improve quality of life. In those patients, treatments um, that risk compromising the immune system can be reasonably delayed. Uh, because again, the, in the lower risk MDS, you have a little bit more wiggle room to balance the risk of exposing yourself with every visit to the hospital for either blood tests or transfusions versus um, the uh, slowing down the uh, symptoms associated with the disease. Therapy that results in increased contact with healthcare environments, frequent blood work draws for monitoring or visits or injections can be delayed. And you might see that already in your um, uh, visits to the hospital that your uh, physician might have asked you uh, or negotiated whether or not instead of doing blood work every week, perhaps reducing it to every two weeks, or if you're having your blood work done every two weeks, maybe reducing it to every four weeks. Or if you're um, uh, coming for actual in-person visits, that is being delayed or converted to a uh, non-in-person visit, maybe a virtual assessment instead. Therapies that reduce transfusion needs, such as erythropoiesis stimulating agents, that's the erythropoietin that we were talking about before, may result in a net decrease in healthcare visits and potential viral exposure. So that might be something to talk to your family physician, sorry, to your hematologist or, or oncologist about, is that there are certain medications like erythropoietin that stimulates the production of red blood cells and that might actually reduce the need for the number of transfusions that you have to, to come and get. For some patients, such as those for whom hypomethylating agents have failed, clinical trials may represent the only treatment option. So clinical trials should be pursued on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, there's a lot to unpack in clinical trials. It depends on 
where is the clinical trial you're involved in? Is it in another city that you have to travel to? Is it in a different country that you're trying to get to that you can't because the borders are closed? Is the clinical trial uh, requiring that you have multiple in-person visits to have blood tests done, to have uh, in-person assessments done, which all increase your risk and exposure? Is that clinical trial even open because of what's going on? Will that clinical trial uh, be altered or affected because the medication comes from a different country? So those are all important questions uh, if you are considering pursuing a clinical trial or if you're on a clinical trial right now, it might be affected. Allogeneic stem cell transplants may be feasible, but again, it may be difficult to obtain donor cells, stem cells from unrelated donors, especially from outside the United States. So this again is a American uh, United States um, guidelines. In Canada, it'd be very similar as well, that if you're uh, a candidate for a stem cell transplant, do you need to go to a different country in order to get it? Or do those stem cells come from a different country? Some institutions may need to delay allogeneic stem cell transplants due to lack of available hospital beds, particularly intensive care units, but uh, this may increase risk of disease progression. So all of those are important considerations for, for treatment in MDS during this uncertain times. Uh, one question um, in here is um, about transplants, oh, sorry, uh, transfusions, blood transfusions, and the American Society of Hematology has a, a comment here as well. Should transfusion thresholds be altered in patients with MDS related conditions? And I'll add in there, is um, blood transfusions safe or is there a danger in receiving blood transfusions right now? So we're trying to cover all that. So given the evolving shortages in blood products in many locations, and this, if you do have relatives, friends and so forth, please, please tell them that it's still very important that they need to donate blood at this time as well. So yes, a lot of donor centers um, are um, places where you, there is exposure to other individuals. But right now, if uh, we don't have volunteers that continue to donate blood, then there will be blood shortages. It is reasonable to attempt to increase transfusion intervals and lower transfusion thresholds for red blood cells to a hemoglobin of seven grams per deciliter. So in our units, hemoglobin is tenfold higher. So what they mean here is 70 grams per liter in our units. So if you, uh, if you are getting transfusions right now, let's say every two weeks for a hemoglobin of let's say 80 or 90 even, perhaps at this time it might be uh, a good time to discuss with your physicians about reducing the frequency and maybe waiting till the hemoglobin gets a little closer to 70. That way you're not going as often. So if you're going once a week for a transfusion, it might be time to think about uh, seeing how you feel every 10 days or every 14 days. And for those going every two weeks, considering a even longer interval. And, and just seeing what your body can, um, can take. Um, transfusions cannot be infused at home, which is another question um, that um, I know people have asked. Unfortunately, it has to be given at a center that um, has the resources for making sure that you are matched to the right type of blood and that all the checks and balances are in place for you getting your blood transfusions and it can be monitored for transfusion reactions by a nurse. So that's all very important. But maybe you can reduce the frequency or the interval of those transfusions, whether it's red blood cells for hemoglobin. Uh, and then for platelets, they also mentioned platelets should be transfused for levels below 10. Again, this is 10 to the ninth power per liter of cells. So the, this is the unit. But if it's below 10, um, you should consider still getting a platelet transfusion. Okay. Um, the, the symptoms, of course, uh, need to be modified for symptomatic patients. That means if you're obviously 
having chest pain and shortness of breath with a hemoglobin of 75, well, you need a transfusion. You, you can't wait until your hemoglobin is below 70. Okay, so it really is an individual basis and a negotiation with your uh, hematologist or your physician arranging the, the transfusion. The question about is there a danger with receiving blood products uh, apart from you know coming into a hospital, getting exposed uh, to the healthcare staff, getting exposed to other patients in the waiting room or in the um, the chemotherapy suite or the IV therapy clinic. I, I think are all um, dangers with getting a transfusion. But at this time, there's no evidence that COVID-19 can be transmitted in blood products. This was, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago now. There is um, some data of uh, COVID-19 in uh, blood products, but um, uh, given, and, and that data I think was out of China, so I, I think the jury is still out, but um, right now we believe that the benefits of a blood product for those who need it far outweigh the potential risks associated with a blood product transfusion. Should the frequency of visits for patients with MDS related conditions be changed? Again, every time you come in in person, face-to-face -face visits, you're increasing that risk. So. Um, you would have to have a negotiation with your physician about um, how frequently you actually need to come in for blood work, for uh, your transfusions, for your face-to-face -face visits. So acknowledge that patients with NDS related conditions often have a significantly compromised bone marrow and require frequent transfusions, assessments, if at all possible face-to-face -face visits and laboratory checks should be reduced or eliminated. Uh, MDS patients and those with related conditions who are being followed with a watch and wait approach can have visits delayed until after the risk of COVID-19 decreases. And so we do have patients with MDS, like uh, we said, there's so many um, types of MDS, but also how patients behave is that um, some patients are not treated with anything. They're just being monitored, a watch and wait approach. So those individuals, it can be delayed. Or for those who can't, it could be spaced out so that they can occur less frequently. For those receiving active therapy, it may not be possible to alter visit frequencies as regular blood monitoring of blood counts is still medically necessary. In these patients, laboratory visits should continue, but direct examination can be minimized or eliminated on a case-by-case -case basis. For those individuals getting their uh, blood tests done regularly, one thing I would suggest is ask if you can have your blood test done in an outside laboratory if those laboratories um, have uh, procedures and processes in place that you feel comfortable with where you're coming in one at a time or by appointment um, and uh, it's a clean sterilized environment then you can continue to do so if uh, you feel that um, you are uncomfortable with that there are laboratories that um, you can phone up and pay a out-of-pocket fee usually about thirty dollars to have a technologist come to your home to draw blood work. Uh, finally, this is the last slide on COVID-19 and MDS, I believe. Should the management of a patient calling with neutropenic fever be altered during the current pandemic? Remember we said, if you have neutrophils that are low, you're neutropenic, and if you have a fever, you have febrile neutropenia. That is a very important issue that needs to be addressed and you need to have uh, an assessment done. Those patients, NDS patients with febrile neutropenia remain at increased risk for life-threatening infections, and often these infections are bacterial infections. Clinical assessment in the standard timelines, that means urgently, remain appropriate with access to antibiotics as appropriate. Testing of COVID-19 should remain symptom-driven in patients with new respiratory symptoms, and these are just examples. There's more symptoms that we know of now, uh, beyond fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, uh, muscle aches, pains, uh, loss of uh, hearing, sorry, loss of um, taste or uh, or smell. Uh, acetaminophen, so that's Tylenol, is preferred to ibuprofen for reducing a fever in patients with MDS. The reason for that is that if your platelet count is low, medications like ibuprofen uh, reduce the function of uh, your platelets. And so aspirin or acetaminophen is probably a better choice. Should MDS patients and those with uh, related conditions, for example, those with uh, deletion 5Q being treated with lenalidomide stockpile medications? The answer is fairly universal for this. 
uh, the time of this recommendation, there have not been reported medication uh, shortages specific to uh, patients with MDS and related conditions. Um, there is not a process in place to supply medication demand greater than typically monthly supplies for these medications like lenalidomide. Okay. Um, a couple of things uh, I would suggest for those listening. Uh, how can you participate in research? Because uh, there is so little data out there about MDS and COVID-19 or hematologic disorders and COVID-19 is that uh, different countries and um, uh, world organizations have registries that uh, we would recommend you getting involved in um, should you develop COVID-19 and understanding what its impact is on uh, blood disorders. So the American Society of Hematology Research Collaborative Data Hub has created this registry uh, and uh, there's a link on here as well and at the end I think you will have the uh, presentation slides that you um, uh, please have a look at and consider. The Canadian Blood Services as well, uh, people have talked about this COVID-19 convalescent plasma donor registry. What, what is that? Well, what that is, is uh, for individuals who have had COVID-19 and have recovered from it, they potentially have developed an immunity to COVID-19. Could their plasma help others who get this uh, virus? And to test that out, um, they are uh, collecting a plasma donor registry. So this is not for MDS patients, but perhaps for the MDS patients uh, online, if you let your uh, family and friends know. If you're younger than the age of 67 years, if you previously had a confirmed positive COVID-19 laboratory test and you fully recovered from it and symptom-free for at least 28 days, you could potentially donate your plasma and that might help somebody else down the road. So that's it for me. Sorry for taking so long. I thought this would take about 40, 45 minutes, but clearly I talk too much. Do people have questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. This was great. I think that um, we've had three questions come in and I think that you've answered all three. Okay. Um, I will wrap up, but I'll just watch the chat box as I do so, just in case anything else um, comes in. Um, I'll, I'll just watch it here. Time. Yeah, if you see something that I didn't see, let me know. Uh, so thanks so much. I just want to remind everyone that um, the presentation has been recorded and we will ensure that it's posted on the website next week. Um, I appreciate all the information. It was really informative, especially the up-to-date COVID-19 information. I think um, uh, that's going to be really helpful for a lot of people. I know that there were a lot of questions and I think you answered many of them. Um, we wanna let everybody know at, at AMAC, we understand that even though we're in the middle of a pandemic that many of you and your family members are still dealing with MDS, AA, PNH, um, and that you still have questions and need support, we're here for you. Um, we are working remotely, but you can always um, reach us. You can call us at any time if you have questions. Um, our number is one 888 Eight four zero 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 three nine, um, or as always, you can reach us by email at info at amac.ca. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Um, if you need to reach us, please do so, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, again, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for today. I really appreciate you sharing your Saturday with us and everyone coming out on a Saturday. I don't see any more questions. All right. Any thank you for having me. And, oh, thank uh, you. So Stay much. safe, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks so much, and we hope to talk to you again very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.